Welcome to Blue Grit Radio, the podcast that explores making better cops for a better community. I'm your host, Eric Tung. I've been an active police officer since 2007. We will dive into the aspects of police culture, health and wellness, leadership, and mindset. You'll hear from experts not only from policing, but all industries as they relate to being our best with purpose, passion, and positivity. Join me as we share stories, lessons, and advice so we can all be better for ourselves, our teams, our families, and our communities. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another episode of Blue Grit Radio. This is your host, Eric, and today I'm joined by esteemed guest, Lisa Jaster. Lisa, thanks for coming on the show. Thanks for having me, Eric. Yeah, absolutely. Well, it's been really cool to interact with you and get to meet you through uh, our friends at The Collective, super high achieving group of individuals that meets and chats and discusses these these big things that are critical towards self-development, societal development, but fantastic experience to be able to hear some of your thoughts and learn more about you. Before I keep rambling, you know, your big claim to fame is you're one of the first three female army rangers. So thank you for your service and thanks for trailblazing. I think that's super badass. Absolutely. My pleasure. And I just want to say like to date, there's been like 100, 125 women who have actually graduated from army ranger school. So it's it's a pretty big deal. Um, and I love the fact that we don't even hear about it anymore. Yeah, it is one of those things, right? You know, a lot of people uh, focus on Roger Bannister's story about being the first to run. Oh, man. Was it the six minute mile under the six minute mile or five, four? Four minute mile. My goodness. Okay. Clearly, I'm not a runner. <laughs> Clearly. I, I just finished a book about um, Zambino, who was predicted to be the first man who was going to run under the four minute mile, but then he went off to World War II, became a POW. Yeah. Yeah, so I the... only know that because I literally finished that book this morning. Yeah. And clearly I need more coffee because people are like, man, that is <laughs> Eric is slow. If he's thinking like it's like a world record back when to run under six minutes. Yes, I'm not that fast. Uh, but <laughs> is that the uh, unbroken story that you just referenced? Yep. Yeah. yeah, that book was really, really, really impressive. Um, and, you know, thus his story was so impressive. You know, um, probably completely off topic, but uh, I did I do jujitsu in the morning before before my work day. Yeah. And I had finished the book this morning and was thinking about it, talking about it. And we were complaining about being old and broken. And all the people I was rolling with were one guy was 57, one, you know, I'm 46. Uh, there was a bunch of people that are older because we're the people who do it before work, right? Mm -hmm. And um, the topic of unbroken came up. It's like, you know, if you've ever read any of these stories, and I'm not talking about elite athletes, I'm talking about the absolute physical resilience, if, if, you have the right mental state, mm -hmm. um, the things your body can really go through. Not that you ever want to push yourself as hard as someone who's been in a concentration camp or a POW camp. But the fact that not only did all of these men survive these horrible situations during World War II, but they also came out and were able to reclimb the physical ladders and, and regain a lot of what they had lost. It's just phenomenal what the human body can do if you're willing to mentally push through barriers. Yeah, no, that's fantastic. And it's absolutely on topic, right? And a, a huge thing with wellness, resilience, and just betterment is is simply that, right? And recognizing what constraints we put on ourselves or what constraints others put on us. And I think that ties right into the fact that we're talking to one of our first elite special operations military personnel. And like you said, right, there's enough uh, women that have followed you and your peers that it's not really something we discussed. That is one of my questions I had was, you know, do you have a sense of how many more? And it becomes more normalized. And because there were constraints before and they're not because other people show that it's possible in the doubters to be silenced. Yeah. And what I think is amazing is there are still people who doubt that Chris, Shay, and I, so we were the first three to graduate from Army Ranger School. They still doubt that we made it through on our merit. But it's kind of like, has the army been pushing people through for eight years now and, and no one said anything and nobody's written the tell all book, like the conspiracy theories need to stop. And whether it's your field, whether it's, you know, law enforcement, whether it's the military, whether it's jujitsu, go ahead and look at some of those high level athletes or those high level performers. And there is 
I still understand there are biological differences between men and women, and we can talk about that all day. And that's fantastic. And the fastest male sub four minute mile and the fastest female are never going to race each other and be successful. But we're not talking about the highest level. We're talking about high level performance where the performance is based on the job requirements. So what do I need from LE? What do I need from military service members? And what they needed from me was a base physical fitness, that level, and a mental and physical endurance, because that was another thing. So I was 37 when I went through. The average age for the the men is 22, 23 years old. Um, One of the things we found that as a 37-year-old female, um, there were accusations that I was getting extra food. Now, Eric, you look a lot younger than I do, so I have no idea how old you are. I'm 38. I'm 38. How old? 38. Okay. You definitely don't look 38. But imagine this year what your metabolism is like versus what it was like when you were 22. Oh, man. I could imagine. Now, add on the fact that I'm a female and female metabolisms are slower. So people are like, well, Lisa's been there for almost six months. How is she not just real skinny? How is she not? They must be giving her extra food. She must be getting extra sleep. She must not be walking as far. And it's like, no, at 37... You know, part of what allowed me to make it through that school was not only the fitness coming in or the mental resilience. It's the fact that I didn't lose weight. If I eat, if I eat 500 calories a day, I'll probably lose five pounds where if you did that, you would waste away and not be able to get out of bed because that's life. Like that's, that's it's life. crazy. Like where sometimes where the slings and arrows come from, where the form they come from. And it's not, not even, you know, I'm not even hearing, and probably there were accusations like you know your people went easy on you but like you're getting more food like what a random uh source of you know i guess doubt or you know trolling to be like questioning your food input yeah that's how people are right or some people are right but if you watch um i love using the crossfit games as a reference like some of those women, those elite, all of the Thorin's daughters that are out there, all those yeah. Nordic goddesses, yeah, yeah. Um, they could crush 90% of your local gym go- goers, male or absolutely, female. Absolutely, absolutely. You know, put, them, put them in pads and put them on the football field. I bet they'd hit pretty damn hard. Mm-hmm. Now, we're not trying to do that. We're not, we're not asking to integrate football. But we're, we're, we are saying, hey, listen, there are women out there that can perform at the same level as some men. And, and why shouldn't we allow those doors to be open to them? Yeah, because it, it threatens people. You know, I think like why, when we consider why not blank, it's usually fear. And it's a, some flavor or version of fear. Um, but man, I just want to circle back. Like, I had no idea you were 37 when you went through. Yep. Because, like I just shared, I'm 38, and I'm literally having conversations on this podcast and with my closest friends to be like, "Yeah, it's really not fair for you know when I get a Facebook memory flashback 10 years ago, and I and I feel you know I felt normal and I felt like there was a lot of improvement to be made back then, which is kind of the point of you know challenging yourself. But I look at photos of myself from like you know 10 years ago or six years ago, and I'm like, man, I wish I could be in that shit. Maybe. You know, maybe there's a new version of, you know, my best shape for my late 30s and approaching 40 than, you know, in my late 20s. So I'm already trying to give myself grace. Whereas you're, you know, operating from like in the peak of performance, right? Like, I think it's fair to say, like, if you go through any of these special operators divisions, whether it's the Rangers, the SEALs, like, you're right, those are largely men in their quote unquote prime, like early to mid twenties. Uh, maybe, you know, some might even argue late twenties is like a male's prime, but I think most people would, would agree that late thirties is generally not regarded as the physical peak of performance for men or women. Right. Definitely. Um, you know, but you talk about that. And of course I talk about it all the time. My training partner this morning is 18. Uh, he's absolutely fantastic young man. I always call him a kid. And I made a joke about him being so young today. And he was like, well, I feel like I'm old because all I do is listen to you guys talk about your arthritis and now all my bones ache. <laughs> it's like rubbing off on him. <laughs> he, he said he's getting old before his time. But you know, we do talk about that because 
it's amazing what I can do when I compare, now I'm 46, I compare my 46 year old self to my 36 year old self where I was competing in uh, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and I still do BJJ. And I was doing CrossFit competitions. I was doing some lifting competitions and I don't know that I can move the weight that I could back then that I have the cardiovascular capability, but I work out so much smarter now. I can do more. I can teach I can help my kids, you know, that, that depth of knowledge. And then, you know, it's other things too. Like I can snap back into it a lot faster because I have decades of, of time served, shall we say. Mm -hmm. And then things like, Hey, yeah, I was reading a, a book about world war two this morning. I finished that book and I started a book on MacArthur. I can also speak on so much more. So I go through the same thing. My husband's a few years older than me. So we, we often talk about the progression of fitness is my number one, but in the world of mind, body, and spirit, like now my mind needs to be focused. And as I get a little later in, in the uh, evening of life, maybe spiritual fitness will become something I improve on. It's always a goal, but I'm, I'm, it's always one I fall short on. Yeah, I love that. And there's so much to be challenging of, of ourselves, right? And to recognize, yeah, you can take the branch of physical fitness. And then before long, we realized, like we already discussed mental fortitude and mental strength and, you know, adversity and how, how critical that is, right? So they're all intertwined. But even in the vein of physical fitness, I've been socializing more like, hey, maybe I'm not, as you said, right, maybe I'm not going to move as much weight as ever. And to be honest, like when I think about my deadlift, I think it's probably wise given some things I've had with my back and some, you know, some things that the x-rays have revealed about, you know, probably wearing duty gear for so many years and twisting in a car. I am i don't do it for sport. And so it's not something that would probably serve me to put that much pressure on my lower back. That's okay, right? But there's always something to be growing in. You're talking about a sport like BJJ. You could think about, yeah, if not strength, maybe relative strength, right? You're talking about working out smarter, and that's something that it's taken me some time. It's something I've thought about, talked about, but really it's not until a lot more recently that I've actually applied it, right? For years, I would skip hours of sleep to try to get longer workouts in, and now I'm like, that's a fool's errand, right? And you think about recovery and all these things, right? So I love how you focused on this continual challenge and even to say, hey, like spiritual practice, because as we get towards the twilight years, yeah, like your body is going to fail. And there is some people might think depressively of that notion and other people might recognize, hey, it is what it is. And so I got to keep my mind sharp. I got to be connected with my loved ones and this sense of purpose and everything else beyond what's tangibly physical in front of me. Well, and we hear about it in your field as well as in my field. When people retire, they almost pass away soon thereafter yeah, so because fast. they lose their relevance, they lose their drive. And um, I'm not sure what resources you have in the LE community. I know in the military, I'm I'm on the board of directors or the board of advisors for an organization called Team Red, White, and Blue. But we specifically focus on people transitioning out of this all encompassing career because it's not a job. You know, um, if I worked at any engineering, when I worked for Shell Oil Company, I didn't go home and wear Shell stuff. I didn't talk about Shell on the weekend. I didn't go from gas station to gas station to see, ooh, are these Shell gas stations representing me correctly? But if I see somebody in uniform at the airport and their uniform's jacked up, I walk over and, hey, soldier, may I touch you? And I fix their uniform. Mm -hmm. Or if I see somebody with a combat patch on their backpack. And I'm like, Hey, where'd you serve? You know, there's this, um, permanence and yeah. deep level of connection. And, you know, if I don't have something else, whether it's my fitness trajectory through a technical sport like jujitsu, where if I'm not stronger than you, I sure as hell could potentially be smarter than you. Mm -hmm. Um, there's, if I don't have something like that or a spiritual basis or academic endeavors or even the ability to pass on my knowledge, I will become that old soldier that just fades away. And I don't ever want to be that. Yeah, that's so huge. Uh, you you hit it right on the head where it's not just a job, right? It's not just a vocation. And, you know, whether folks in the military did four years or 20, like it just becomes such a part of people, right? Some people, it might be less so because they didn't have that attachment and it was a means to an end. But for people that 
serve to a higher level to a higher degree like you know it's when you enlist it's not like you have to go to ranger school and try and see if you pass or fail right and so it is that added layer but yeah for sure for the law enforcement community you're right there's a lot of terrible stats as far as how quickly people may pass away especially when they don't have any sense of purpose and love that you're doing that work you know helping tie in those communities probably somewhere around this uh, episode airing there's an interview i have with luke goodish and you know we're talking about mental health and he's recognizing as a counselor there's a lot of data with transition points being people's most susceptible towards depression and mental health issues because your world is kind of flipped upside down right whether it's going into the military whether it's coming out starting this career leaving that career life changes with family like and it makes sense when you think about it yeah well um it the where I train and it's Maha Sinkies in San Antonio. And I plug that only because if there's any LE people, there are extreme LE discounts. There's days mm-hmm. where the the first responders can come in and train for free. But so we do have a, um, a vast amount of first responders, law enforcement that I train with. And a couple of the guys are getting, again, the guys I'm training with are in the forties and fifties and they're looking towards retirement or I have to be a detective. Like I, I can't do physically what I used to be able to do and it's not safe for me and it's not safe for um, the public that I'm serving, but it is a higher calling. And as they transition to their next role, it affects, they don't, none of them have LinkedIn accounts or Facebook accounts or social media, or they haven't leveraged some of the things I've leveraged to build my my career, my post-military career, because I'm a reservist. So I just do army part-time. I've got mm-hmm. a full-time career. So they haven't built those, those bases for the next step. They haven't stayed in touch with their friends. Everyone I've ever deployed with or been stationed with, I'm connected to via a social media spider web. So a lot of the, the law enforcement specifically um, minimize their digital Im- imprint because you know, there are a lot of people out there that don't like law enforcement. So unfortunately for them, they don't have those ties and connections that, that I might have, or the typical person might have. Yeah, that's huge. And we know that this day and age, we're better about talking about these things that we frequently talk about on this podcast and many other resources, podcasts, uh, social media, right? The awareness, but luckily uh, we have that. And then there are these resources, right? So maybe you don't know who to talk to and you can hear a conversation with Lisa or, you know, the folks on the collective and you're like, man, okay, that piece that was just said really resonates with me and it encourages you to know that you're not alone. And then maybe you're not on social media or aware of these things, but then you look up like a support group or, you know, a message board that can help you with that. So yeah, I love that. You said message board and I started giggling because um, my son is 15, sophomore in high school. He's starting to consider the military. Yeah. I'm like, I got to introduce you to dark humor um, because it's a big slap in the face when you go to basic training and you start start realizing how dark it is. And um, But that's comforting for us. My, my brother was um, a volunteer SWAT officer in Southern California, and I didn't know there were. They call them reservists, but they don't get paid. So they volunteer to go run towards danger while everyone else is running away. And, you know, my mom, of course, hates the fact that we both enjoy the dark humor, but I went and got my, my formal photo taken. He goes, Oh, you got your funeral photo. And I said, yeah, when's the last time you got one? And he showed me his picture of him and his blues. And I showed him my picture of me and my blues. And my mom's like, what funeral photos? And I'm like, yes, this is, this is the reality of it. But when you speak to people who are outside of the community and you don't have those little chat groups, they think something's wrong with you. So you mm-hmm. start thinking something's wrong with you and you start closing in and, and not expressing yourself in, in one of the ways that's really cathartic. It's really healthy for, yeah. for us to have our little dark humor. Yeah. Corners. And I love that. <laughs> that's such a thing. Yeah. The funeral photo and one of my old sergeants called it his death photo. And he's like, I'm never getting that thing retaken because that's just going to get me like closer to, you know, uh, it was almost like a fulfilling prophecy. He's like, no, but if, if the only photo that the PD has is of me from like 20 years ago, then like, why would I die? Right. And so it was kind of a funny twist. I had a terrible one where, you know, the there was a sergeant in charge of taking all of them and the coaching of 
was so bad. It was like literally like twist your head and turn your chin down. No, like farther down. And he gave, I don't know if it was just a messed up joke. Like he gave everyone like a double or triple chin, but one of my best buddies loved haunting me with that photo. Like it would just pop up here and there. He'd take a picture of it in the hallway. And luckily I'd had it retaken when I promoted Sergeant. And at least I'd be more presentable because it was just so bad. That's funny. But, uh, yeah, there was a psychologist that recently was asked about that on a you know a webinar I was with. Uh, shout out to Dr. Brooke Bartlett. Got her on episode 64, 3, something like that. But they actually asked about gallows humor in re- regards to moral injury. And she said, yeah, like it's, and I'm not going to quote her, but like it was positive because people are talking about it, right? And it might not right. be the best at all, all the time. But the converse to gallows humor is for some, maybe no humor and bottling it up, which we know is not good. I wonder if this conversation comes up, you know, on the theme of gallows humor, it's an increasing theme with law enforcement to live outside the blue world, as it were. So yeah, have your your cop friends and buddies, but also make a concerted effort to not just hang out with them, but also civilians and people outside of that world, because that's not really how the world is. And it's a very limited purview. Is that or that conversation or notion in military culture? It's hard in the military because if you don't live on base, you live within driving distance because you have things like 15 minute recalls and 30 minute recalls. So I know when I was active duty, especially, it was a huge problem for us to live in Savannah, Georgia, but be stationed at Fort Stewart. So if I was on Red Cycle and I needed to be on a 15 minute recall, I was either sleeping in my office on a cot or I was at a buddy's house who lived in town. So you're almost forced to live in those military communities. And now I live right outside of San Antonio. Yeah, I was just going to say. Everybody's got DV plates and everybody's, you know, in the community or has ties into the community. So so it is hard to get away. And I actually have a very good girlfriend um, stood up in her wedding and she joked during her wedding that, oh, yeah, I was Lisa's civilian friend. Like, I mm. had one, my the civilian one. friend. Yeah. I kind of like that, though, because it's a blended community. You know, talk about bases. It becomes very much a fabric of the community, right? Kind of like a universities in town. Then the community kind of rallies around that, and then they tie in. So I think that there is a balance there where, you know, optimistically, there's people that otherwise might not know soldiers or interact with them. But because they're in the community, they see they're normal people that have the same stressors and the same things going on and care in the same way, a little different, I think, than, you know, potentially, it's not like there's just a big, well, I guess there are kind of cop towns, like where people tend to gravitate and live. But yeah, that's an interesting dynamic for sure. When I think another big difference too, is with regards to what our law enforcement go through is in the military, our life is moderately stressful, but unless we're in a deployment scenario, We're really not at high risk. Our training is high risk, but it's accepted risk. Things that we knew were coming. Where your first responders, if you always hang around with other people in the community, everybody's intense all of the time. Every morning that you wake up, you're at risk. Firefighters are the same way. Like if you have to do your job, there is a probability no matter how low it might be, that you will not come home that night. And so I think... More so for our law enforcement, it's really important to have a community of friends that almost don't understand your stresses Mm -hmm. so that sometimes you get to be just a dad or just a brother or just a husband or just a whatever, you know, fill in the blank. Yeah, I think it's I think it's necessary. And I definitely could cite and reference different parts of my life where I gravitated away from, you know, my college buddies that I'm super close with. And I'm confident that I'll have college buddies and I'll have cop buddies that will be my friends for life, right? But I know that there's times when, you know, you just kind of feel a little bit more socially isolated because they, quote unquote, don't get it. But sometimes Mm -hmm. that's a good thing, right? Because, you know, we don't need to think about ambushes all the time. We don't need to talk about how four cops just got killed uh, in gunfire in the last week. And they're oblivious to it. And that's okay, right? Because the world shouldn't always focus on these things. And I think it could be a reminder just to live, quote unquote, a little bit more normally at times. Right. You know, we talked about your entry into Army Ranger School um, in your late 30s. So what would little childhood Lisa say about that notion? 
You know, my mom had this really crazy saying or, you know, it just was annoying at the time because I was a teen and she was my mom and everything she said that's was how, annoying. That's how it um, goes, yeah. Because that's life. But she used to say, don't ever look back and say I should have, I could have, or I would have. And then I added a rule onto that and I said, and don't ever not be able to tell your mom about it. Like she might be mad, but I should be able to tell her about it. Mm. So that kind of became from a very young age, my decision-making process if I do this or don't do it, would I say I should have, I could have, I would have, and would I have to hide it from my mother? Because your mom of all people, the one who birthed you, loves you unconditionally, mm -hmm. if, if you're lucky, right? Yeah. So th those were my criteria. So my young Lisa probably would be like, yeah, it sounds exactly like something I would do. And and I played on a boys' soccer team for quite some time. You know, I, I danced ballet, but then wanted to do martial arts. And and so I always lived somewhere in, and I, I wasn't really, I'm not surprised. I wouldn't have been okay, surprised. Yeah. I think, um, I think the only thing that would have surprised me is the fact that it took so long, like in my head, in my head, I never felt like I was being held back. Like every time somebody's like, yeah, but you're a girl or you're a woman or women don't do this. I'd always be like, oh, well, that doesn't apply to me. And, yeah. and it would just kind of move forward. So the fact that it took till 2015 for women to actually be allowed to try things that were boys only, I think that would be the thing that would be, would have been the most surprising to juvenile Lisa. Yeah. I think that it's really important to pay attention to these social constructs, if you would, or, you know, kind of cultural norms. Why do you think that you kind of shirked it off and said, well, that's not me? I had an older brother and older stepbrothers. Um, my stepdad, when I was little, I would go down. He had a little universal machine in our basement. I'm like, hey, I, I want to work out. And so he would have me do pull-ups. And it would surprise me because when I went to school, and I know that it's national, but that presidential fitness test you do in elementary school, my daughter did it a couple years ago. I remember my son doing it. They had me doing girl push-ups and bent arm hang instead of push-ups from my feet mm. and pull-ups. And I was absolutely shocked. And because I had never been treated that way, it, I had never, my stepdad was never like, oh, well, you're a girl, so you can't lift. You can't work out with me. And then my mom ended up being my first gym partner. Like we would go to the gym together. That was our way of trying to reconnect when I was in my terrible teens. You know, we would go to a little gym and we would lift together. So uh, yeah, I think it was just put in my mind really early that, yeah, there's all these constructs, but they only apply if you allow them to. I think that's huge, right? So you can recognize or we can recognize that things may be a little bit better socialized today than they were when you were growing up. But even at the same time, you have parents that sound extremely supportive and they were essentially able to neutralize that, right? Where it wasn't really a thing because you had this supported environment where they were modeling that really positive fitness behavior and you know there was there weren't these like asterisks of like oh well Lisa's doing it so we're gonna do this or or she's not gonna do it so I think that's awesome I think that's a great reminder because we frequently do intersect and talk about family and parenting and I know you're a super involved parent you know with all the activities you know from when you're hopping on the collective and just trying to make it all work so um <laughs> I want to get into that but no like the, you're just super active in shuttling kids around which is a thing yeah. And um, so I've seen some some great, I love social media. So I know a lot of people hate it. I always read the comments. I My heart rate doesn't get up about you know negative comments online. I, I wear a whoop. So 24 seven, I monitor my heart rate. So I can prove to you that I don't get agitated by this wow, stuff. I need to know the secret of that because I am not immune to it. Uh, yeah. Well, the, the key is to watch your kids and your husband get mad for you and realize, oh, that seems silly. Mm, okay. <laughs> and, then, and then you look, you click on the people who are really negative towards you. You click on their page and you, you quickly realize, you know what they they're holding on to whatever they have. Yeah, and, yeah. um, and I'm blessed to have a whole lot more so I can look at stuff with a, through a different lens. Yeah, but, absolutely. um, so I love social media and there's a bunch of stuff about how popular Taylor Swift is with oh, regards yeah. to the NFL and yeah. Kelsey and, and all that rubbish. I was talking to my wife about that. Yeah. So you, you're thinking about that and with regards to Taylor Swift and her support of Kelsey and, and parenting and going out and doing things like we are setting the example for the next generation. So if we're sitting in the living room, even if we're not including our kids in our conversation and we're saying anything negative about 
some famous girl who supports her famous boyfriend, then we're wrong. And we're showing our kids that it's okay to not treat people in the public eye as human, Mm. as new love. We're, We're not being supportive of all these things. Now, you can be petty, but you're teaching the next generation pettiness. And that's where I talk about social media. A lot of parents are trying to keep their kids off social media. I did the opposite. My 11-year-old has all the social media accounts. Now, granted, I have their passwords. Mm -hmm. I don't really check them, but they think I can and they think I do, which keeps them in line to some degree. But I want them exposed to all of this so that they know how to keep their heart rate down, so that they know that it's just somebody who wouldn't have the intestinal fortitude to say that to their face. If somebody's saying it on the internet, that person's never going to say it to your face. They don't have the ability, nor the will, nor the way, and to learn how to deal with it at a very, very young age. Teach them, hey, this is this is what right looks like. And the best part of exposing my kids to social media is, you know, my son's trying to get recruited for college athletics. So we're building his YouTube channel. It's Mm. not public yet, but, you know, I can't just have senior year football season on there and expect him to get recruited. So he has a YouTube account and he logged in on his own and he actually clicked on one of mom's videos and looked at all the horrible comments and- Uh. And I was worried, right? How How is this going to end up? And I didn't fail. I fail at a lot of things, especially when it comes to parenting. He didn't come with a manual. I've screwed up a ton. But this is one area where I didn't screw up. His response to somebody was, you don't know my mom. You don't see her alarm go off at 4.30 every day. You don't see her hit the gym. You don't see her go to jujitsu. You don't see her read books. You don't see her making protein pancakes for the family. And he just listed out all these things like, you know, you don't believe this story, but what you don't see is the five hours of every day dedicated to personal or family development outside of a nine to 10 hour work day, outside of sleep and carpool. And the fact that that's how my 15 year old son responded to a hater was just one more reminder that it's really important to emulate to our kids and to show them, hey, this is what being a good person looks like. This is what a balanced life looks like. This is what a balanced diet looks like. Like We are their best examples for the future. And if we want 2030 to look better than 2020, then it's our job to make that happen. There's so many things you just said that I'm going to try to unpack because I almost feel like I need to listen back to it, but it won't be practical for the purposes of this conversation for me to do that. But I was just rapidly writing down some things. But amongst them was, you know, again, to talk about modeling, right? You're talking about how you live life and man, how closely are your kids paying attention to that, right? It sounds like your kids are very driven and probably by the nature that you were driven. And you're also, you learned that from somewhere, right? You had this, um, this notion supported by your mom to say, yeah, and like, don't regret things. And then you had the, the awareness and the young wisdom perhaps, or the foresight to be like, yeah, and don't do something that would be, you know, that you'd be ashamed of, that you'd be embarrassed about. And I love that highlight because Ultimately, as parents, and this is a theme for me with my, you know, four-ish year old daughter is like, when I think about the failures, which you also highlighted, uh, and we'll come back to that. But when I think about my misses, and there are a lot, and so I appreciate you highlighting that, because it is important, is at times that I feel like I'm inconsistent, or I, you know, I didn't come off the way I wanted, I reflect back and I'm like, man, what is my real goal, like moving in life? And it's to be a guide and to be a mentor, but not just that, like I know best, but that I have that relationship where my daughter's going to come to me, right? Where she's going to yeah. come to me in her times of grief and strife, even if I don't have all the answers. Like, I just want that, right? Like, if it's 10 years from now or 30 years from now, like, I just want that fantastic relationship, regardless of what happens in the middle. Like, that's what I'd be remiss if I did something or I started doing a pattern of things that would make that difficult, right? It, which is to include judgment or anything like that. So, it's just kind of these themes that I think are important to highlight for people, especially young parents. You know, I'm talking to a lot of guys that are brand new parents. And I'm like, I don't know best or better than you, but here's what I'll share from my yeah. limited exposure, right? Another thing, talking about failure, I feel like because you so readily talk about failure, it's probably why you're able to achieve so much, right? Like when we look at failures like learning lessons and stepping stones, I think that's critical. And I definitely was not always that way. I still have 
a lot of work to do in that ground. But I do realize that the quicker you can pick yourself up, the the more you're going to move forward, right? And so I think that shows a lot of humility and resilience in that. I also love the conversation of protein pancakes. I love that, you know, that you're just building in this family wellness. Like my daughter calls them daddy pancakes. It's a different recipe than what my wife makes, which are also really healthy, you know, just bananas and some eggs and some flour, rice flour. But like mine have some whey protein and some collagen. And she just knows like, yeah, I haven't had daddy pancakes in a while. Like I'll go for that. So um, (laughs) yeah, I love it. That's funny. One of the things I talk about uh, going back to the parenting is my kids, right, wrong, or indifferent, when they were really young, I realized that they, that children are more observant than I thought they were. Oh, yeah. It was one of those things where my son couldn't even walk. He was walking around in one of those buggy things that have the toys on mm-hmm. it and then it has a little tray and you just kind of, they walk by you, you throw food on them and hope they let you finish kicking, cooking dinner, you know, those things. And he opens a drawer and it's a drawer that has the scissors in it. And I just thought, oh my God. And I looked at him, I'm like, close that drawer. And he closed it. And he was probably 18 months old. I mean, he was less than two. And I thought, oh my God, he understood me. All right. From here on out, I'm going to assume that my child understands me. And then um, we introduced the option of two types of parenting to the kids. So when they misbehaved, hey, listen, you are going to eat your dinner. You can eat it now. I can reheat it five times and you can eat it at 10 o'clock at night. You can eat it for breakfast tomorrow. We can fight about this or you can eat it now and we can just go watch cartoons. Your choice. Mm -hmm. Either way, you're going to eat this food. Mm-hmm. And and we would explain to them, hey, I'm not going to yell at you. I'm not going to discipline you. I'm going to tell you, you're going to make a choice for yourself. And as that's progressed to, I have an 11 and a 15 year old, when they say things, I'm like, okay, I can answer you as mommy or I can answer you as Lisa. Which one would you like? And they know that Lisa is going to be, you know, the scientific example or some sort of rationalization because I'm an engineer by trade. Mm. And the mommy example is going to be the, not necessarily the, I told you so, but but the, hey, this is this is what's morally and ethically right. And this is why, you know, and, and I give them those options and it's progressed to the point where as I fail, my son will point it out to me. And sometimes it makes my husband twitch because God, you should never talk to your mother that way. But he'll say things like, hey, mom, that was really rude. And I'll say, okay, let's back up. I don't know what you consider rude. What did I do that was rude? And I try to say, hey, listen, I know I screwed up. I just don't know how I screwed up. Mm. So it's okay for you to be mad at me. It's healthy for you to be mad at me. But let me know why you're mad at me. And I'll let you know that I'm either going to do it again because I'm the mom and it's my job to do that. Or, hey, as your adult guide, because you're almost an adult yourself, I will back off that and try to figure out a better way to address situations. Yeah. What a way to communicate. And sometimes to say, I don't know how to communicate this. And right, it's it's humility, it's admitting fault. And some parents don't know how to do that. And we certainly, my wife and I certainly don't always do it, but we are intentional. We have conversations, we kind of debrief or, you know, after action, sometimes we're like, man, we needed to say, I'm sorry, you know, and so that's in our vocabulary that our daughter hears, right? Hey, I'm sorry, I made you upset. And can we talk about it? Or when our daughter calls us out, said, hey, you did this and you shouldn't do that. You know, <laughs> tongues don't do that. Like, I'm like, yeah, Mar, you're right. Yeah, you're right. Absolutely. Yep. Um, I'm going to I'm gonna think about that. And I think I was feeling a little frustrated, right? So we use the same vocabulary that she uses. She's like, yeah, I get frustrated sometimes. I'm like, yeah, it's all right, right? Like we just, we take a moment, um, something we talk about it when we're ready. And, you know, so it's just like, it's a little simple when you think about it, but Oh, I was reminded of another thing, you know, talking about modeling, but people being all curmudgeon about Taylor Swift and this and that. Oh, yeah. You're literally talking about this. And you know, my wife was like, she's literally one of the most influential people right now. Like, do people have to really get upset that the camera pans over to her, you know, after a down, you know, it, in the middle of two plays? I mean, she literally shifted the economy by having, a, you know, this musical tour. And I'm like, yeah, why do you have, why do people have to get mad? And then I thought about this, where if we look in the mirror, I mean, we all mutter things under our breath, right? It's usually politics and everyone can remember their parents growing up saying, oh, this, this and this thing or uh, something in the news, right? But like, how often do we do that? And I'm thinking about it now, I'm, I'm sure there's probably a lot of things that I do to, you know, my wife or, you know, with my, my kid around. So yeah, just these, these little focal points of where we decide whether we want to be positive about it and negative. And I hear this, you know, transcending positivity where you can even say, 
social media love it, right? Like I'm super yeah. active on social media and with the podcast and I cannot say I love it, but I do recognize it's a tool and it's part of life. And there's a way that you can weaponize it for good or for evil and trying to, you know, kind of alter the filters. And I appreciate how you gave insight to people to consider as they get kids that are older, right? Like how can you set those boundaries or toggle those inputs to have it serve you and your family the right way? Yeah. And, and I think, although it's, it's hard for us as adults that our world, you mentioned politics is so polarized right now, but so we live in a small town in, in Texas. I'm just North of San Antonio, very, very conservative area. It's not socially conservative. It's economically conservative. You've got a lot of Trump signs, but as a whole, like you can walk around, look in the way you want to look, act in the way you act. Really in this part of Texas, it's just don't mess with my guns and don't <laughs> yeah. give me a state tax and we'll probably be happy. We'll, we'll be good. Because of that, everybody's a little bit more conservative leaning as a, in general. And so when our kids get home from school, it's fun for me because of the way I've spread out my tentacles in social media. I have just as much conservative talk in my feed as I have liberal talk in my feed, which is really funny being the first woman to do something in the military. Conservatives and liberals both have some angst yeah, towards me, yeah. which is hilarious. So I've got, I've got both in my feed. And so when my son comes home and is saying, hey, did you hear about this? Or we're talking about Nikki Haley, or we're talking about presidential debates, or we're talking about Joe Biden, he'll say something that you know, the masses at school believe I, I can easily play devil's advocate and he'll walk out of the house. He's like, mom, I don't even know how you're going to vote this year. And I'm like, oh, I don't either, actually. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, it's it's good because if we if we are careful with our utterances, we can force our children to have free thought before they leave our home so that it's not like when we were young, we only knew what our community did and what our parents taught us. Right. And you go away to college and you're like, oh my God, or your first job. And you're like, oh my God, people mm -hmm. think differently than Plymouth, Wisconsin, which is where I grew up. You know, people don't understand whatever, you know, and, and it was a dairy community. You know, people don't understand dairy or the paper mills or whatever we grew up with in, in the Midwest. And so I have to educate people, but I also have to be educated. We can do that at home. We can start that free thinking before our kids leave the house. And, and that's kind of exciting for me. Yeah, that's huge. And there's certainly a generation where the news that came in, the, you know, the one channel that was on, if it was on, or the, the one paper that was read is like, that's the news. And then, you know, you move forward a little bit, and then there's competing news outlets. And then now there's so many options. There's versions of independent news like coming up. So right, if people want to be more holistically exposed, I won't say educated, because fake news and all that. But like, if yeah. people want to be aware of the conversation from different angles, which I think is extremely healthy because you go down one way, it does feel doom and gloom and you go the hard right opposite way. Like right was not intentionally a pun, right or left, right? Like the opposite of what we were just doing. Then it seems like a very similar tone of doom and gloom. And I feel like, you know, oftentimes with police, we talk about investigating a scene. You talk to one person, you talk to the other person. And the truth is usually somewhere in the middle. And I really appreciate that. And I think that the I've been guilty of this where I'm like, man, the world's never been more polarized. But I recently heard in a podcast where someone was analyzing that and they actually spat out all these different historical political movements and where the country was going and this discord. They're like, you could argue that it's actually been never less polarized. And it was such a twist again, right? Like I never would have entertained that thought until I heard it kind of distilled that way. And then you're talking about, you know, social media is positive, right? And I think that that's so key is just to mind the lane and try to quiet the noise and focus on what's positive. And whether the topic is an aging body and how you can best like lean into your sport and be your best physical self, or whether it's the noise and the climate outside or in politics from the media, like it's just it's good to focus on the positive and be grateful. And I mean, what a day to be alive where you can even have this, you know, kind of, you could say privilege where you have this thousand dollar thing in your pocket that can tell you anything you want to know right now. Like that's crazy. And that's the majority of our country has that. Yeah. I, I recently found this website. Absolutely love it. Um, it's called allsides.com. And when you look up a topic, uh, presidential debates, it will have the first article will be right leaning. The the second article will be left-leaning and the third article will be centrist. 
and it'll quote who it picked it from and you can read all three and and nobody tries to summarize it for you there's nothing in there giving you the take of the take so um it's a real great way to access exactly what you're talking about is how do you look how do you look left right and center mm. um been been a huge fan of that lately just yeah. in case people haven't heard of it it it, it was I this great it, golden yeah. find for me very cool. You know, before we get too close on time, I do want to ask you about Delete the Adjective. Um, yes. That is your book. If you could please tell us about the title, where that comes from, if you could break down kind of what, what you discussed in the book alongside your story. Yeah. So um, Delete the Adjective, A Soldier's Adventure in Ranger School is um, the title came from after I was one of the first women to graduate from Ranger School, I was the first reserve. I was also 37 years old, turned 38 two weeks after I graduated, had two kids at the time, you know, just just not the resume that they expected to be in one of the firsts. So I was invited um, by Mrs. Michelle Obama to sit in the uh, her box to watch the President Obama's last State of the Union address. And I was allowed to bring one person with me. Now, my husband was like, hey, I'm good watching the kids. Like, it's, this is a school night. I got to work. You go off and do whatever. So um, I invited a friend of mine. Her name is Sue Fulton. She's one of the first women to ever graduate from the United States Military Academy at West Point. She's also a gay and lesbian right activist. She's been huge in the LGBTQI plus community. It was really interesting because I brought her as my guest. It w She's this amazing woman. And somebody wrote a newspaper article or, or was posting online and was like, what is Major Jaster saying when she invites this, this gay and lesbian right activist as her guest of honor to the President's State of the Union? And, you know, Sue and I kind of just looked at each other. We're like, uh, what was I saying? I was saying you live in the area. You love D.C. You know how to navigate politics. You're really cool. And I respect you. And she's like, wait a minute, you never listed off that I was gay in there. And I was like, I didn't. And she goes, sometimes I wish people would just delete the adjective. Mm. And so that's where the title came from. It's, you know, Eric, you and I can be friends, whether or not your male, your age, your job description, your ethnicity, your religion, all of that stuff puts you in little boxes. Yeah. But those boxes aren't closed to me. And I would actually prefer you to have a bunch of different viewpoints than me because that makes conversations more fun and, and life more exciting. I took that and made it the title of my book because as much as it's cool that one of the reasons we're talking is because I was one of the first female graduates, I don't want to be a female graduate. I just yeah. want to be a ranger qualified individual regardless. Like there was plenty of people that had various adjectives and none of them made them better or worse. It just made them diverse. And uh, I guess it's my play on diversity delete the adjective and go for merit uh, really is what I'm going for. The actual book, you can read it as a story because that's really what it is. It's just outlining my experiences at Ranger School, highlighting that really this story could be a man's story, a woman's story, a black man's story, like a gay man's story. It doesn't matter. It could be. And people who have read it have said, oh, I did this. Oh, that's, ex wait a minute. That's the same experience I had. And I said, yeah. You know, n none of this has a asterisk and says female only mountains, female only swamps, female yeah. only test like that. That just didn't happen. But if you want to read deeper, there are definitely a lot of leadership lessons in there about, well, how do you deal with a woman who wants to be in a predominantly male environment? If you're a sergeant on the police force and you have your first ever female on your team, how do you deal with her? Well, guess what? She didn't join the police force and sign up for your team because she wanted to be treated differently. Mm -hmm. So stop trying to figure out how to treat her and treat her like a damn police officer. Yeah. And and so that's kind of the underlying message. But I tried really hard not to be preachy because the truth is we all know the right answer. We just might not have met that person. You might have never worked with a woman in the police force or the woman you've worked with or somebody who kind of got pushed into it. Maybe they weren't a good shot or maybe they weren't good at fitness. And they gave you an opinion that was based just on who they are, an anecdotal opinion. And so the story is to help introduce you to somebody like me who, yes, we are taking the family hunting and we're going to go live in the woods for six days in March because that's what we all enjoy to do. And 
our male hunting buddies will be coming with my 11 year old daughter and for them, me as well. Cause I yell at them when they stink too bad in the field, but whatever. As you should at times. (laughs) No, I love that conversation and I'm so curious about it, you know, for myself to look at that book because there are so many things that are translatable to everyone. Like personally, I can say, yeah, I wanted to be a police officer. I didn't want to be an Asian police officer and I'm not trying to be the first of anything, but just have the conversations. Like I realized that and I've told the story where I work in a diverse community and when I showed up and someone felt a certain way because I was Asian in a positive way, right? It was someone else in the the general large Asian community of a different country, right? Just got excited asking if I was Vietnamese, which I'm not. I'm Chinese in heritage, but I I almost wanted to deny that connection. I'm like, hey, I'm just a cop. Like I'm officer right. of this and like I'm here for this problem. But I've kind of cut that off and like I removed their attempt to empathize and connect which I'm not happy about. But I share that story to say like, hey, it doesn't have to be this or that. It sounds like you've struck that balance where you recognize like, hey, I'm among the first uh, female army rangers and some Democrats are really into that, but then like it's military, so some Democrats really aren't into that. And the same thing for Republicans, right? But just the notion of like removing the adjective, yes, like you are an army ranger. And at the same time, you're like, well, it's also... Like not to deny the fact that it was really cool to be one of the first women because it was symbolic of a lot of things. It was really inspirational for a lot of people. But it sounds like you're kind of straddling that, which is something that I was kind of curious about as far as finding that balance where it could be multiple lanes of positive twists on this. So, and and something that I've, I've struggled with the same thing, like when do I bring my mom version to work? When do I bring the fact that I, I am wearing makeup, I am wearing kettlebell earrings and I did blow dry my hair so that I didn't look like a, a, a dump truck when, when we were speaking. And, um, you know, how do I, how do I rationalize both? I, I am a woman, I am a mom, I am these things. And I think I've kind of gotten to the point where I say adjectives describe us, but they shouldn't define us. And so in your scenario of being an Asian police officer, people are going to feel more comfortable around you if they're of Asian descent or other BIPOCs, like other minorities, other people who aren't white males. And, and in that can add value if it's adding ingenuity. Like if I'm going to make a diverse team, the biggest thing I want to do is make sure that I'm not trying to make a pretty cornucopia. Like I'm not trying to make a display of I've got my one black, my one Muslim, Mm -hmm. my one white, my woman, and look at how pretty everything looks together. What I want to make sure is if I'm bringing you into an Asian community because I need to connect with the Asian community more, that you actually identify more with Asians and that you were raised in an Asian community. Yeah. But if you're a guy who looks Asian that was adopted by a white family, like right. you're not actually adding any diversity or value to that scenario, that scenario. Yeah. That's a great So example. we need to think about yeah. both. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and so, because it's your your direct experience, but then also how you feel about it, right? So if you know the chief or the administrative staff at the time was trying to you know reach out to the Asian community, like maybe as a younger officer, if they knew how I felt about things, I just wanted to be one of the guys. Like maybe that wasn't wouldn't be the best time. Whereas like now or recently, it would be very different. Like how I would approach that, how I could check you know the little noises in my head or the the potential kind of sources from ego where I feel like I have to be a certain thing. It's like, no, I could, I could just be me and then just care about this thing with this energy, right? Yeah. I kind of want to ask you about balance. And I think that it's such a such a focal point for people that are out achieving a lot. And, you know, just a little anecdote I'll share with the audience is that you know when you dropped off, I believe it was your daughter to a, a practice of some sort. And you were <laughs> sharing with us that you know, you're on a run, like while she's at practice, you know, you're rucking, like you're doing like a weighted run. Um, yep. So you're just like, you're crushing it, right? And like, you're clearly very engaged as a parent, you have a full time job, you have a second time job, you're a reservist, like you have all these things, you're in BJJ, right? You're a fitness fanatic, what some may say, and I mean it in the best way. Where do you find balance and what helps you navigate all those things? Because for some people, they're already exhausted. I'm borderline exhausted thinking about it. But, um, you know, for a lot of people, they're like, man, they're, she's literally doing 10 times more than I could imagine doing. And it's making me tired. I think the first thing is we have to release the guilt. And the only way to release the guilt is to understand there is no such thing as balance. 
tomorrow, my son is going to go to, to the division wrestling competition. And this is his first time going there, even though he wrestled as a varsity athlete last year, somebody else was better than him in his weight class. So he didn't get to compete to potentially move his way up to state. I canceled all meetings. I'm going to sit in the bleachers. People were like, hey, can we call in between? I said, no, I will work on my computer in between his matches. I will do stuff, but I am going to be 100% present for this moment. The example you're using, my daughter has a three and a half hour or three hour volleyball practice twice a week. And then she's got other volleyball practices. So I can sit and watch her and be the proud mom, but she doesn't care that I'm there. She doesn't want to hear my feedback. She really doesn't want me to film her. So I'm not adding value by being there. So what can I do to add value elsewhere? And so, you know, number one is there is no balance. Like every, there's priorities and those are, have to be your priorities. When I drive my daughter to volleyball, she is not the priority. Getting her there and back safe is the priority. Now those three hours in between, I leave things in my car. I leave my weight vest in the car all the time. I leave my gi and my, the clean gi, not yeah, the gi yeah, I wore yeah. the, that morning. Oh, you'd know. I leave it, a yeah. clean gi, mouth guard and tape because I, I tape my ankles in the trunk of my car at all times because maybe I'll get a chance to train today. Maybe I won't. But by, by having it there, I give myself opportunities to do something. I keep a Bible in my glove compartment. Now it's been there for two years and I'm only to Job. So I'm not doing a really good job reading it, but it's there in case I, I get stuck at carpool. So I think when you're trying to work through balance, it's identify those things that are critical and mark those off on your calendar. Hey, I have got to lose weight because I'm not healthy. If that's your thing, then on your calendar, you should have that 30 minutes of cardio three to five days a week on your calendar, just like a dentist appointment, just like a meeting with your boss, just like your anniversary dinner with your spouse, like that needs to be solid on your calendar. And then everything else, and we in the military, we call it opportunity training or hip pocket training. I'm sure police force has the same thing. You have something in your pocket where you can study weapon systems or whatever it is that's important to you. And it's just there and you might never use it or you might use it every day. And, and that's where a lot of, a lot of my fitness time comes to, all right, well, I don't have anything else to do, but I have, I have everything I need to train in the car. I can either sit at Starbucks and check my phone for another 30 minutes, or I can go for a 20 minute run and feel a little better about myself. So I think, I don't know if that really answered that question, but that's kind of how I, I choose to pack my day. Yeah, it does. Um, because the thing in the back of my mind, as I listen to our whole discussion and I'm a part of this is that, you know, I hear so many recuperative efforts and practices in your life, right? Gratitude, this positivity. And I, I view that or my take or supposition is that that aids you in the drive. But I love how you describe this. It's not really a balance, right? And truly our life becomes so imbalanced. Like There's times where we got to shut it down. We got to show up for a fam, right? Like yes. there might be a time where you leave work and that's something, you know, especially in first responder land, like if you're not taking time off for your own mental health crisis or your family's family crisis, like that there's an issue, right? So you have to take care of what's important to show up in other places. And I think that so many people might view this balance notion, right? Like you're juggling, you're juggling three balls, four or five, six, seven, or you're spinning plates and more and more like something's gonna give, something's gonna crash. But when I hear how you described it is to remove this notion of the struggle for balance, almost like a theme of intention where rather than juggling six balls, maybe you juggle two or three at a time, you set them down, you pick one back up and you pick up these other two, right? And then that way you're able to achieve all these things and stay on top of all your goals because they definitely span a lot of different angles. Uh, but it's not to say you're doing it all at once all the time. Yeah. You know, I heard something great. It was a tidbit this morning of um, one podcaster asked his guest in 30 seconds, give me how to deal with stress. What a horrible question. This guy was so on. Uh, God bless him. Yeah. Um, and Do you remember what answer, it was or who, who it was? <laughs> no, but I'll, I'll tag you in it. I'll, I'll okay, look for it okay. after this and tag you in it. Um, but his response, this guy's response, again, kind of funny random story. My my husband will send me reels and whatever the next reel is is always hilarious to me. This is this was the next reel. My husband mm. sent me something. This was the oh, next Okay, so reel. you can your your husband doesn't get credit for this find. Oh, he knows I do this, so maybe he gets indirect credit. But okay. 
So this guy's 30 second answer was make a list of everything in your life that's stressing you. Like give yourself a time. You got five minutes to think about it. Make a list of everything in your life that's stressing you. Then cross out everything that you cannot manage. Like you can't fix it. You can't impact it. It just exists. I don't know if you're having a kid, there's nothing you can do to make that less stressful. So just, yeah. just cross off. You, you, you can't manage a pregnancy. It's just, trust me, I've been there. It's horrible. Um, for some people, <laughs> you know, your boss is a butthead. Okay. Well, I can't do anything about that. There's nothing I can actively do. I can, I can respond. Yeah, there's you nothing can't I can change and then, how your boss is right. specifically. So then when you look at that list with everything you really can't handle, like you can't impact, you look at what's left. And those are the things you tap family, fitness, spirituality, work productivity. Those are all things you can handle. And once you can get your list down to those, it's a lot easier to balance that day and figure out what do I need to keep in the trunk of my car? Does it need to be my work computer today or does it need to be my weight vest? I love that. So family workout, listening to your Bible on audiobook, and get some protein pancakes ready. There you go. All right. Well, Lisa, thank you so much for your time and this extremely helpful conversation for me and the listeners. Can you tell us all, all the links and all that will be in the show notes, listeners, but Lisa, could you tell us where people can find you and what you're up to? Yeah. So all the social media, I, I love it. I reply as much as I can. Um, if you need information about me, delete the adjective.com that has my book and um, links to everything about Lisa in it. My plug of the day is my biggest physical challenge so far is a 700 mile bike ride. I will be doing it the week of September 11th in memorial to all those who gave their life and service to their nation, their community, and their country. The money we raise from for this 700 mile bike ride is going towards a camp for gold star children. So kids seven, ages seven to 17 who have lost a parent go to this camp in Wisconsin, actually about 20 miles from where I grew up mm. and team one mile, that's the organization. And you can donate at team one mile.com team. One mile is trying to raise money to help get more kids at that camp. And it teaches them all the things you really don't have time to teach your kids period, much less if you're a single parent who's dealing with such a horrible loss. So that's my big adventure. That's my big plug is trying to raise money for Team One Mile. And my effort is riding 700 miles on a bicycle, not a motorcycle, on a bicycle to raise awareness to our Gold Star children for our Gold oh Star gosh. children. I love that, man. As you kept telling <laughs> what you're doing, I was like, oh, 700 miles. I love it. And then you're like, oh, it's, you know, in recognition of Gold Star Children. I'm like, oh my gosh, I love it. And so I got multiple factors of chills kind of growing, but I'm super excited for you and to watch you, you know, remotely and cheer you on and help in whatever way I can. So thank you so much for, for doing that and for sharing your time with us. Thanks, Eric. I very much enjoyed this conversation. Thank you for tuning into another episode of Blue Grit Radio. As always, support this community by subscribing, giving us a five-star review, and following, liking, and sharing posts on Blue Grit Wellness on Instagram. You can reach me there or email me at bluegritwellness at gmail.com. Be well and stay gritty.